I'm standing on Monument Avenue and behind me is the Marcus David Peters Circle, which is a reclaimed space by the people for the people. And that atrocity that we see uh, behind me is the uh, Robert E. Lee Monument. You know, here on Monument Avenue, uh, all of the monuments have been taken, the Confederate monuments have been taken down. The Lee Monument is the last one standing. It is owned by the state, so they say it's tied up in litigation, but it too shall come down. There are well over 50 memorials out here of, you know, and, and the sad thing is that it's continuously increasing. You know, this year alone, we had Donovan Lynch, we have Xavier Hill, we have Mrs. Hill and her three month old who were all unjustly taken away from us, whether it was community violence or violence at the hands of those who are supposed to protect and serve. And so this space is important um, because to this day, we're still fighting to occupy it. Um, you know, to this day, we cannot physically go within the circle anymore because Ralph Northam, governor, temporary governor, Ralph Northam made the decision to put the fence up, as he said, to keep people safe. But it was a way to keep us divided and to stop us from congregating in a very liberated, inclusive uh, manner from taking care of each other. As when we come out here, we feed each other. You know, we take care of each other's needs. And we did have the opportunity yesterday to celebrate the uh, three year anniversary of my brother Marcus David Peters, marking three years since he was unjustly murdered. But you know, within that circle, so much positive has taken place. And when we start talking to, you know, about racism, you know, we must look at the systems that perpetuate it, right? The systems that serve as a barrier to move us, to prevent us from moving towards an anti-racist society. And the move to put up that fence is absolutely one of those gestures. But what we do know is that we the people have more power than the people in power. So many of us say, well, the governor this or the mayor this, why are we waiting for them? Why are we waiting for them to be the peacekeepers and to say, oh, now, you know, they deserve X, Y, and Z. Do we need to wait another 400 years? Because I'm tired already and I'm not even 40 years old. I am tired already, you know, and the work itself is tiring. It is emotionally draining. But if not me, then who? If not us, then who? And I refuse to passively sit knowing that my beautiful daughters who are my heart, they are my reason why, that the pigmentation of their skin can cause them to not be with me anymore. That alone, the pigmentation of our black and brown kid's skin is a death sentence. And that's the reality. Those are the conversations that we have to talk about. You know, and by, for even as black people, it's so easy, it's more comfortable for us to not talk about it. When we face these realities and these pains head on, you know, that's when our power really comes into place. You cannot have these conversations. See, it's easy to watch, you know, the murder of Trayvon Martin, you know, on online and say, well, he don't live here. You know, George Floyd, he don't live here. That's a shame that that happened. But we have it happening in our own backyard. We have it happening in our own backyard. Our elected officials acknowledge what they can't touch, but they refuse to acknowledge what they have the ability to address. And we must start holding our elected officials accountable. I am a veteran educator. Um, I have. I currently serve as a middle school science teacher, so I've taught eighth grade physical science. I'm currently teaching sixth grade science, and I also have served as an assistant principal for six years uh, at the elementary school level and at the high school level. Um, as far as do I consider that line of work to be anti-racism, I have an opportunity as an educator. Um, and as an educator, whether uh, you know it's Black History Month or not, I will continue to always talk you know, about inclusion with our students, um, about diversity, and the importance of accepting people for who they are, right? Um, and so I'm thankful that I, pers I work uh, at a school division that we talk about racism. We talk about racism as being a public health crisis uh, and we're, we as educators are encouraged to have these conversations. Um, so I do, I am thankful for that opportunity to be a part of the push, you know, for anti-racism. Um, outside of my paid job, I am the co-founder of Justice and Reformation, which was started, an organization that was started after the unjust murder of my brother, Marcus David Peters, in 2018. Uh, he was murdered on May 14th, 2018, after he had a mental health crisis, uh, he was completely unarmed, completely undressed uh, at the time of his, of his murder. I am also running for governor here in Virginia, and my run is interesting because I 
I think I have a pretty boring life uh, and I enjoy the simplicity of my life. I live in Middle Peninsula, very rural area. I have six ducks, I have a dog, I have three kids, and I have a beautiful garden. And those things make me really, really happy. However, you know, I believe that we must be intentional and make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to stay in a bubble and say, well, I'm okay, my family's okay, when other people are not okay. And I think that everyone should use their privilege, whatever degree it is, you know. Mine is I am very unapologetic and I am very fearless in fighting for liberation for all of us. And so my decision to even run for governor was due to the continuous failures of the two-party system, specifically the Democratic Party here in Virginia, as the uh, Democrats are the majority in both the House, the Senate, and we have a Democratic governor. However, they will all verbally say that black lives matter, but refuse to pass any legislation to show that black liberation matters. And so, you know, criminal justice, racial justice, those are two things that I have been and will always be very passionate about fighting for, in addition to things such as education, housing, food sovereignty, because there's still strong connections with racism and everything that we're fighting for to include environmental justice. I think that we need to take a moment to reflect, you know, uh, what, what brought us up to this point. And we see the increase in conversations about racism and racism being a public health crisis, you know, post the unjust murder of George Floyd, right? You know, post the, the national, you know, uprises, you know, and people, uh, you know, across all intersections standing in solidarity, you know, on the front line, putting their lives at risk, you know, to demand that, you know, we not just say that black lives matter, but that we enact legislation that shows that black, um, you know, liberation matters. And so to me, it, it highlights what we all know and what we all see and too many of us turn a shy eye to is that racism has never gone away. It's evolved. You know, a lot of times people say we've made a lot of progress. You know, we've come a long way. I say things have evolved. So it may not look the way it looked, you know, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, but it's still here. You know, it just has evolved, you know. And so I think that this is a, a great thing that's happening, but we can't celebrate just having the conversations. And oftentimes we hear uh, people say, oh, they just want to be heard, right? You know, the oppressed people, you know, they just want to be heard. Give them, give them some time to be heard. And, you know, I say so often that this time is different, you know, because it's not a moment, you know, since the uprise, since the unjust murder of George Floyd, right? This is a movement that is continuously evolving, that is continuously growing because black people are taking very fearless stands. Our allies are standing with us to say, you know, we're going to make sure at any means necessary that our legislation reflects and shows that black liberation matters. And so it is a, a, a conversation that didn't happen um, because those in power wanted it to happen. It happened because the people came together and they united across all lines to make it very, very clear and strong demands that our legislation, that our legislators, that they not just hear us, but they take those st uh, bold steps that we need them to take to ensure, this is the sad part, equity and humanity. That's all we're crying for. That's all we're begging for. And it, it, it's something that we should not have to still have people being brutalized as we're standing on the front line, you know, to talk about racism, to demand that we move past just conversations and into action. When we talk about racism, we also have to talk about how do we move forward? You know, how can a person become an anti-racist? And it has to start with acknowledgement, right? Oftentimes you hear people say, and it sounds good, I don't see color, right? So that's a problem in itself. And you can't become an anti-racist if you can't be realistic, right? And so we have to become comfortable having these uncomfortable conversations, and then we need to take an exam in our own self, right? We must take a really, really close look, and even black people, right? You know, there's the movie called When They See Us. I said, I can't wait for the movie that comes out that says When We See Us, because oftentimes we see ourselves as being threats. We see ourselves as, as being uh, not equal and less than, you know, inferior to white people. And so, Lots of conversations have to take place and then we need to go ahead and be very intentional with planning ne the next step. After we get past the acknowledgement, now what are you going to do? So before we can branch out and have the conversations with other people, we need to check ourselves, right? And so we need to have a call to Jesus moment with ourselves, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're brown, and you need to, to, to gain a better understanding of what racism is 
and what role you may have. You know, oftentimes we have implicit biases, you know, and people do things and they don't think that what they're doing is wrong. You know, they don't think that it's offensive to anyone else. So I think that, you know, first having that conversation with self and with your family and then being open to having listening. Be open to listening, right? Because sometimes, too often, you know, when a person says, you know, well, you know, I want to I want to talk to somebody about this they get on the defense, right? They become very defensive and they feel a need to justify their behaviors. So when we talk about steps towards becoming anti-racist, prepare yourself to be a good listener, right? Prepare yourself to take what is being very generously given to you, right? Because someone's telling you about their lived experiences and how some of the behaviors that you either actively do or that you support are racist. And so those are some of the steps that we need to take. We need to ensure that we're electing people in, key le in these key legislative uh, positions that are going to not just say that Black Lives Matter, but enact legislation that shows it. And it's very easy to do. One of the first things that we can do is defund the police, okay? We can defund the police and understand a lot of people get scared by hearing that and when they hear it, they think that's a black people's thing. That's something that black people want to do. However, what we're saying in translation is reallocate funds to systems of care. It all goes back to we are begging for equity, we are begging for humanity. We can be intentional about our own behaviors, where you decide to go shop, right? What organizations you decide to support, where you decide to plant your next family, right? Where you're going to buy your home at. Ask yourself, are you unintentionally only looking at neighborhoods that you deem safe because black people don't live there, right? So again, there are a lot of steps that we can take uh, to ensure that we are moving towards anti-racism and the fact that anyone would even entertain it, that's, that's big, you know? entertain the conversation, right? And then we need to just go some steps, uh, you know, past that. If you are sincerely looking to become an anti-racist, if you are uh, really, truly, and sincerely uh, wanting a diverse, uh, you know, society where we are all treated with equity, right? Not just equality, but equity, right? We need, we need the same access, the same abilities to, to reach some of the same goals, right? To, to be able to exist. And so having the conversations, ensuring that our legislation uh, is enacting, uh, you know, gestures, or not just gestures, but um, our legislators are enacting uh, legislation that is very inclusive, right? And that's not divisive. You know, redlining is very real. It is very real uh, and it, it keeps us very much so segregated. You know, when we look at, you know, Monument Avenue, again, the price to live here is so high that it makes that very clear divide between the haves and the have nots, right? So what is it that we can do? It costs money, but if we put our money together, we can start buying some of these houses and making it more affordable for other people to move into, right? So there's a way that we can reverse gentrification as well, and that's something that I don't hear anyone talking about. I would love to get my hands on one of these big properties and go ahead and be intentional with planting black people in the same places that we were kicked out of. So when you want to talk about being anti-racist, let's talk about what we can actually do to reverse the many harms of racism. So I don't feel that the work uh, of, of anti-racism will ever be done. But it's not something that we can't give up on. It's not something that, you know, we can take a passive, uh, you know, or a reactionary approach to. I think that we have to be intentional with our actions. I think we need to be very proactive. One step in doing that is all kids legally have to go to school, right? And so our schools can be and they should be, you know, our first line of defense in addressing this. We have to start by history lessons, right? You know, and, and you know, our school systems are, are and were created when black people were not even considered human, right? We were not considered the equals, you know, very openly of white people. So when we look at history and the, the lessons that are taught, there's a lot of miseducation taking place in our schools, but we very intentionally skirt talking about racism, right? So. The school division that I work for, we have something called community circles, right? Which is required at the beginning of the day for all, all students. And during that time, we've had, we have these conversations. We talk about racism. We talk about how it makes 
a person feel when they're treated differently because of the pigmentation of their skin. So the work can and never will be done, but what we do have an opportunity to do is to take a very proactive approach, right? And when we talk about racism, it's not just on the ground, the people who are directly impacted. We have to talk about legislation. We have to talk about our local, state, and federal legislation because people uh, and entities are empowered to continue their racist practices, you know, because of the green light and the blessings of a racist system. Okay, systemic racism is very, very real. Whether we're talking about the inability of a family to uh, uh, gain residence in an area such as this monument area that I'm standing at right now here in Richmond, Virginia, you know, or if we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, schools and how some of our schools are, you know, it, there's a clear divide because we have our private schools that get, uh, you know, uh, clear funding from the state while we have our public schools that are in our most marginalized communities that don't even have air condition in the summertime or the textbooks are so outdated, right? You know, we have schools that, you know, the water is not clean. You know, we can take it outside of Richmond, Virginia, and we can go to, uh, you know, uh, Flint, Michigan. Okay, let's talk about the, 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 the water crisis and lead in the water there. And let's look at the people who were impacted. It wasn't in predominantly white neighborhoods. It was in a black neighborhoods that were, were impacted by it. So our legislation has a huge role, you know, in perpetuating the cycle, you know, in the system of racism. Our system's not broke. It's working as it has been designed to function. Our system is unjust, and that is what has to be addressed. And I believe that in order for us to move forward and really making change, you know, uh, as far as becoming anti-racist, we have to kill the snake at the head, you know, and that head is going to be our legislation. We can't put people in these key positions that say that, you know, black lives matter, but they refuse to, to pass uh, legislation that shows that black liberation uh, matters. We can't put people in these positions that look like us, but they're truly not for us, right? And so again, the people who are oppressed need to be empowered, you know, and I'm, I'm a strong believer in that we must enlighten people, empower people, and then we are able to mobilize them. But if we don't start with that enlightenment, okay, then people definitely won't feel empowered to be a part of the change. But once we're able to enlighten them, once we're then able to empower them, to let them know that, guess what, your voice, your abilities are needed, and you absolutely can take on some of these key positions, then we can mobilize them, whether it's running for local city council, running for governor, running for the president of the United States. Because oftentimes, some of the biggest races are sitting in these key positions, and they're making decisions about us that impact us and they don't relate to us. We need to be intentional with creating environments of inclusion. The Marcus David Peters circle is one of those environments. What we saw was nothing but love and diversity. I mean diversity across all intersections. People came far and wide to be here and to take up that positive energy, right? So if we want to truly become an anti-racist country, an anti-racist state, then our actions need to speak 10 times louder than any of our words. We need to go ahead and make sure that we are funding black futures. We need to make sure that we are funding our black communities, our black schools, and giving them an equitable opportunity as we do with our white peers. I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is I don't want to say my, but our, because this is not a one person show. It will never be, you know, but have, being able to be one of the voices of the unheard, uh, because so often it is the poor people, black people, our most marginalized communities, that vo our voices, our concerns and our needs are never addressed. Being able to have the opportunity to host events that are intentional, that bring people together. You know, I hear people say all the time, I just had some amazing conversations, you know, with people that we probably would never ordinarily have conversations, you know, with. So when we talk about being anti-racist, right, that's, that's, you know, kind of pushing the envelope some to, you know, force people to step outside of their comfort zone, you know, to be around people that maybe you were uncomfortable with being around because of the pigmentation of the skin so that we can now go past that so that you can find the humanity in that individual. So, you know, being able to uh, bring people together, uh, you know, as unity and humanity is, is what we're fighting for. And that's 
also very sad to me is that we have to put in so much energy, you know, that we have to continuously, it's kind of like black people are put in positions where we have to be educators, you know, we have to educate people and people feel that that's a part of our responsibility to tell them about racism and how they their behaviors are racist, you know. Um, and so we're fighting for humanity and equity to just be able to survive. And I think that that's, that's what hurts with all of this work, you know. White people don't have to fight for that, right? You know, but as a minority, th these are our everyday struggles. And by us not fighting for it, it affects us in housing and employment and equal pay, you know, and access to healthy foods, you know, uh, as, in, just from an education from A to Z. And so I'm thankful that, you know, I some way or another find the energy to do what I do, but I feel that anything worth having is worth fighting very hard for, you know, um, and the only battle lost is the one that we never fight, and I'm here for it.